Good morning. Thank you, uh, Stephen. Thank you, choir, orchestra. You guys been rehearsing? It sounds like you guys have been working really hard. Just a little bit? Yeah. I feel like you got something going on tonight. <laughs> Truly very excited uh, about Christmas this year. It's an opportunity for us, as Rodney pointed out, for us to all be together uh, after a couple of years of not uh, being together. Uh, so it's, it's really a great, great season. It's great to see uh, the Advent candle lit and, and, and the candle of rescue. And uh, we're walking through a series right now about uh, awaiting Advent, this idea that, that as Christians we live in sort of an in-between uh, state. We are waiting on uh, Christ's second coming, so we're awaiting his second Advent while looking back at his first. And uh, we're looking back at his first uh, by looking at the prophets, looking at Isaiah, uh, who, who looked forward to his first advent. Uh, and so that's what we're doing. And so as, as I said, we're, we're awaiting rescue today. Uh, and, and many of us probably are in a position where we have some kind of need. We need help in some way, whether it's right now, whether there's been a season recently in your life where you need some kind of help, big, small, you're at the supermarket, you can't find something, whatever. We have all at some point needed help, whether we were too proud to admit it or not. That may be a different story. I needed help once, uh, just once. Every other time I've been fine. But once, and I, I think I've told you about in, in middle school, I had a door-to-door -door vegetable selling business. We would grow vegetables in our, in our garden and I would take them around in a Coca-Cola duffel bag and sell them to uh, neighbors that we had. And uh, one, one day in the midst of my uh, glorious days of empire, I walked up uh, to my neighbor's house and uh, what met me on, on a little rise off to my right was a Great Dane. And I looked at the Great Dane and I realized the Great Dane was not tied to anything. It was not, not connected to anything other than uh, air and prayer. And uh, I was afraid of dogs, I think, as a kid. I didn't grow up with them. And so I just turned around and ran, which is like the worst thing you could do. So here's my stubby little seventh grader legs hauling it with this massive devil bag over my shoulder. Uh, I, I get across the street. The dog is chasing me. I get across the street. I, I wind up in my neighbor's yard. My feet slip out from under me. I still remember to this day my two sneakers up against the backdrop of the sky. The duffel bag, the remains of my empire going over my head and the dog leaping over me. And I, I remember screaming the whole way, help me, help me, won't somebody help me? And I was only a couple of houses down. My dad heard me, they were out, um, they were working for the empire. They were, they were, I think, shucking corn at that point. And they were outside and they heard me and so my dad came up with a baseball bat to protect me. No one was harmed, dog mate went home safely. We talked to the neighbors about attaching the dog. But I needed help, I needed rescue. And uh, it's important to know where you can turn when you were in trouble. And uh, my dad was always somebody I could turn to. And for us as believers, we turn to the Messiah's rescue. And I think for many of us, 2,000 years removed from a baby in a manger, it can be difficult for us to look back and say, what does that have to do with the issues I'm facing in my home, the difficulties I'm facing in my family, uh, maybe in my life, in my job, uh, in my heart? How does Jesus' rescue then impact me now? So we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 52, the tail end, and then all the way through 53. And I want us to look at how the rescue that we have is surprising. It's also something that's needed, and it's something that's accessible. So let's talk about how our rescue is surprising. Starting in 52, verse 13, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which has not been told them they see and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. So this is uh, the fourth of the servant songs in Isaiah. And this one runs, as I said, from the end of 52 all the way through 53. And there's a lot of debate between Christian and Jewish scholars as to who this is referring to. 
Now, obviously, as Christians, we believe this points to Jesus Christ. In fact, this is one of the big linchpins of the faith, is how incredibly perfect uh, the Gospels relate Jesus' life and his death and his burial and his resurrection to Isaiah 53. It goes along really well. Jewish scholars tend to point either to corporate Israel, Israel is the suffering servant, or there is a Messiah yet to come uh, that is not, uh, not, not, not been announced yet. But you read this and you read the Gospels, and I think for many of us, you can sit there and you can be like, how in the world does anybody who knows the life of Jesus and reads this come to any other conclusion but Jesus Christ? And the answer is that his rescue is a surprise. It's a surprising rescue. Now, it's not a surprising rescue because God would rescue people. I think most people believe that God in some way, shape, or form rescues people. He intervenes on their behalf. He delivers people. He comes to their aid. I think most people, if they are theistic in any kind of way, shape, or form, believe that about him. But in this case, it's the way in which the rescue takes place. It's the form. Look at how he's described in 52.13, it says, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He'll be high and lifted up. He'll be exalted. Now, that sounds like a rescuer. That sounds like somebody I can put my trust in. But then Isaiah goes on. Notice it says they're astonished at him. His appearance was so marred. He's disfigured. He's not attractive. In fact, he's so disfigured, it says he shuts the mouths of kings. Now, this doesn't mean he's such a tough guy that he walks into the throne room and the, and the kings are all afraid of him. And so they don't say anything. No, 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 no. Kings value power. They value strength. They value the ends to which you would think that a normal rescue would come about. Armies, right? The way in which God chooses to rescue his people is through someone who is humble and rejected. And it's so surprising, so confounding to the people, to the kings, that they're dumbfounded, they're speechless. It says in 53.1, who's believed what he's heard from us? Isaiah is saying, nobody's gonna believe this even though we're gonna tell them about it. It's an unbelievable rescue. It says he comes from dry ground. He's like a root out of dry ground. This means he doesn't have a lot of staying power. They think that he seems like you, you, he's just not gonna be around for a lot of time. You can't put a lot of faith in him. He's gonna seem that way. It says he's not attractive. And this means he has little weight or gravitas. It doesn't mean that necessarily the Messiah was ugly. It means he's the kind of person you'd pass on the street or you might meet somewhere and be like, what was his name? And barely picture his face. And then it says he's despised, he's rejected, he's full of grief, he's not esteemed, he's ignored. Now when you're assembling your superhero squad, these aren't the qualities you look for. You want super strength, super speed, flying, super brain power. Oh, and while you're looking for it, Find us somebody who's despised and rejected and easily ignored. That's the guy. He's the linchpin. Nobody is looking for this kind of deliverer. In fact, the Jews, even their first king, Saul, he was a head taller than everybody else and very attractive. They put their faith in the physical appearance. After Saul and, and, and after, this, after Isaiah writes during the exile, there would be these revolutionaries that would be raised up. And they would try and overthrow Rome. And they're always physically strong or, or capable of getting a following going. And every single one of them are crushed, killed. When I was chased by a dog, I was yelling, help me, help me, won't somebody help me? Now as embarrassing as that is for me to admit as a grown man, I wasn't looking for just anybody to rescue me. This was a great Dane. It was huge. It seemed huge to me anyway. It's like a horse. If a toddler had walked out of the house with a play sword and stood between me and the dog, I would not have been comforted. My hope is that I would be compelled to some level of courage to protect that child. I don't want to say I wasn't going to run away, but I may have. I don't know. I was pretty scared. If a chihuahua came out and started barking at the great Dane, I would not have been comforted. I wanted someone to help me, but I wanted somebody big, strong, physically capable of taking on this dog. And that's the same for us. Whenever we want rescue, whenever we want God to intervene, whatever area of our life we're looking for deliverance, we have a very specific script in our mind of what we want God to do. You want rescue on your terms. 
And we're very specific about this. Or you're trapped in a job. You want God to get you out of the job. Or you want him to take that boss that you don't like or that employee that you both, both don't like. Maybe, maybe you're both in the same room right now and you don't like each other. You want God to move you on out of that company. If you're single, you're looking for God to deliver you by giving you a spouse. If you're childless, you want a child. If you're lonely, you want a friend. If you're addicted, you want recovery. If you're tired, you want rest. These are not bad things. These are very good things. In fact, the reason why we think of these things is this is mostly how the script is solved. This is mostly how rescue comes about. When you run into these problems, when you run into these concerns, this is usually how God delivers us. But we have this tendency to look back on our ancestors, our spiritual ancestors, and be like, well, how did they miss Jesus? It's so clear. Well, it's clear to us. But we still miss God's rescue now, just like they missed God's rescue then. It's such a surprise. We need to be open to the fact that God may want to deliver us in a way that we don't expect. We have this expression, right? It's called whatever it takes. So when we want something badly enough, I want that promotion, I wanna, wanna get a degree, I, I'm gonna get married, you're like, whatever it takes, I'm gonna go for it. I'm gonna put all my eggs in that basket, whatever it takes. I want you to change that, hopefully for the rest of your life, but let's just concentrate on a smaller goal. Let's do this season. Rather than whatever it takes, let's say whatever he wants. God, however you choose to deliver me. Maybe this season is really difficult for you. Maybe it's hard because you're lonely. Maybe it's hard because there's a loved one that's not here this year or for whatever reason you can't get back with family, whatever it is. Rather than saying, God, whatever it takes, I'm not gonna feel this way. Maybe you turn that over to him and say, God, whatever you want for me this year, that's what I want too. And that takes an act of faith. This is the Lord's prayer, right? Our Father who's in heaven, hallowed be thy name, the kingdom come, will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. Whatever you want. We need to be ready for a surprise. Again, not that God would rescue us. I don't think that's surprising. But we do need to be ready for God to surprise us in how he might go about rescuing us. If a baby in a manger was the beginning of God's rescue plan, or rather, part of God's rescue plan, part of the climax of God's rescue plan, then maybe, just maybe, He wants to surprise us as well. So just because it's surprising, though, doesn't make it any less necessary. We're still in need of rescue, right? Rescue is needed. Look at verse 4 of chapter 53. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I've been reading a lot about uh, Isaiah 53 this week. And I came upon an essay, essay, and you'll see it at the end of the PowerPoint, uh, that was talking about this word stricken. It says, we esteemed him stricken. This word is used 78 times in the Old Testament. The Hebrew word is naga, naga. It's used 78 times, and sometimes, very few times, it means to be physically assaulted. So something that seems like what's going on here, beaten, crushed, stricken, struck, that seems to be what's going on. But 61, so 61 of the 78 times, it appears in two chapters in Leviticus, Leviticus 13 and 14. And there, in those chapters, are the Old Testament laws regarding what do you do with somebody who has leprosy? What do you do with somebody who has a contagious skin illness? So how do we evaluate it? How do we treat it? What do we do with them while they're recovering from it? And how do we welcome them back into the community? And the word naga is used again and again and again for the word diseased. They are stricken with a disease. They're diseased. What do you do with the diseased? And when you use this interpretation for Isaiah 53, I feel like the rest of this chapter, the rest of this song makes a lot more sense. Look at 52, 14. It says, as we were astonished at you, his appearance was marred. When you have leprosy, it eats away at your features. Your nose gets eaten away. Your fingers and your toes get eaten away. 
It says in 53.2, it had no form or beauty that was pleasing. It says he was despised in 53.3. He was rejected by men and they hid their faces. In the ancient world and in the medieval world, when you, were, uh, when you came upon somebody that was sick, and this is a very archaic uh, way to do things, but they would actually cover their faces so that they wouldn't breathe in the evil air. We still do, we're wearing masks now. That was a joke about wearing masks. Sorry. It's my last joke, I promise. They would cover their faces. They would hide who they were. They didn't, they believed it wasn't because of germs, like we believe. We found out why we know. No, no, no. They believed there was some kind of evil air around the person, so they'd cover their mouth. It says in 53.8, he was cut off from the land. They would take lepers and they would remove them from the community. And here's where it gets really interesting. The way in which lepers were cut off, there was a, a, a process to bringing them back when they were clean. It talks about it in Leviticus 14. You can turn over there, you don't have to. We're gonna be there for just a little bit and then come back. Leviticus 14, verse 10, it'll be on the screen as well. And it says, and on the eighth day, he, this is the, the, the leper, or former leper, shall take two male lambs without blemish and one ewe lamb a year old without blemish and a grain offering of three-tenths of an ephah, a fine flour mixed with oil and one log of oil and the priest who cleanses him shall set the man who is to be cleansed and these things before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And the priest shall take one of the male lambs and offer it as a guilt offering, that's important, guilt offering, along with the log of oil and wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. Skip down to 14. The priest shall take some of the blood of the guilt offering and the priest shall take it and put it on the lobe of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot. And skip all the way down to 19. And the priest shall offer the sin offering to make atonement for him who is to be cleansed from his uncleanness. And afterward he shall kill the burnt offering and the priest shall offer the burnt offering and the grain offering on the altar and thus the priest shall make atonement for him and he shall be clean. So why did I just read this wonderful Christmas passage from Leviticus? Just incorporate it into your readings. Maybe we'll do it next week for uh, the, the third Sunday of Advent. First, again, the offering that's presented is a guilt offering. It's a guilt offering. You see it in 53 verse 10. It says, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for what? Guilt. Secondly, the blood of the lamb is put on the person in Leviticus. He's put on the right earlobe, the right thumb, and the right big toe. Ladies, go and get a manicure and a pedicure and just say, I just want my right thumb done and my right big toe and I'm done, I'm out. What's happening here is that this person was cut off. They were consecrated to, to, to God as a person of Israel. Israel was viewed as a kingdom of priests. But because they had a blemish, because they had this, this infection, they were removed from society and sent to live outside the city. And so they were cut off. So when they were brought back, they had to be reconsecrated. Now, the only other place that the blood is put on the earlobe, the thumb, and the big toe is when the priests of Aaron are consecrated to serve before God back in Exodus. There, it's not a guilt offering. It's just a burnt offering. But the same thing applies. Those, things are, those people are being consecrated to serve God. These people, these lepers that have come back and are clean, are being reconsecrated to serve God again. So what's happening? What's going on here? Isaiah is writing to the people of Israel and saying, you are about to be cut off from the land. You are about to be exiled from the land because of the sin of our people. We are going to be like lepers sent into exile and one day we're gonna to get to come back. And our Messiah is gonna bring us back, not just to the land, but he's gonna cleanse us from a deeper, a spiritual leprosy that we don't even know we have. And he's gonna cleanse us from it. So what does this mean for you today? Well, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, takes on three different roles in this drama of bringing lepers back into fellowship. First, he becomes like one of the lepers. We've read about how he's marred, how he's stricken, how he's cut off. He comes on and takes on this role with us because we all have been born into a situation where we have a spiritual leprosy. It's called sin. You're born into it. You can't get away from it. And we are all unclean, alienated from God, not close to him, and born into this condition. 
And Jesus Christ, the Son of God, comes born as a baby, born into the leper colony that is our world of sin and brokenness. And amazingly enough, he's not infected with the leprosy. But what he does is he takes on the consequences, the alienation, the punishment, the rejection, the torment. And he puts it on himself, even though he doesn't have the disease. And he puts it on himself. He becomes like us in order to redeem us. But he doesn't just stay as the leper. He's also the guilt offering. That's why he goes to the cross. He's the pure, perfect guilt offering because he's the son of God. He's not just a man. He's the son of God. So he can be the pure, perfect, clean guilt offering while at the same time identifying with the lepers. It's perfect. And so by his blood, by his wounds, we are healed. He's crushed. He's pierced for our transgressions. And so all of the, uh, the, the uncleanness of our disease goes on him, the lamb. And we're cleansed and we're forgiven. And then the third place, the third role he takes on is the priest. Standing at the entrance of the tent of meeting at the tabernacle. And any and everyone who comes to him and says, I want to be clean. He puts his own blood on their ear, on their thumb and on their big toe. He cleanses them. He cleanses us with his own blood, not the, the blood of a lamb that we bring. You can't bring anything to cleanse yourself. The leprosy is too deep. It's gone too far. We are marred and fractured by it. The only hope you have is to go to the lamb of God. Go to the lamb of God. Because he was stricken, he was naga for our sake. Only the Messiah can cleanse us from the spiritual leprosy that infects us all. I think this is one of the reasons why Jesus hangs out with lepers so much. Because he's telling everybody, I'm here for them and I'm here for you. You know what happens when Jesus heals one of the lepers, right? Everybody gets really excited, right? Like it's almost overly excited like somebody's blind or deaf and people get excited about that. But then like when a leper gets cleansed, there's a whole lot more excitement. Why? It's because when you had leprosy, you lost everything. You lost your family, you lost your home, you lost your job, and you had to go live with a bunch of people that you didn't know that had the exact same disease that you had. Some of you were quarantined perhaps during COVID. Imagine that for your whole life and not in your home. And so when they were cleansed from leprosy, they got their life back. Jesus is extending to you the same offer. You can have your place with the king back. You can get life back, eternal life. Instead of being cut off, our rescue is deeply, deeply, deeply needed. Because we all have this condition. We've all had it. There's this great story in the Gospels. Uh, it's in Luke there's 10 lepers along the side of the road. Jesus is on his way to die. He's on his way to be the sacrificial lamb. And these 10 lepers are crying out, have mercy on us, have mercy on us, have mercy on us. And Jesus stops and he says, go and present yourself to the priest, which is exactly what Leviticus 13 and 14 tells them to do. But you're supposed to do that after you don't have any disease on you anymore. So all 10 of them go as an act of faith. They're like, all right, I've still got leprosy, but I'm gonna go and present myself because Jesus told me to do it. And as they're going, they become clean. They become healed. Well, obviously, they're very excited, but only one of them, one of the ten, goes back to Jesus and offers worship and thanks and gratitude. And Jesus responds, with only one of you come back, weren't there ten of you? Many of us, many of us in this room, have been cleansed. We've gone to Jesus, we've said, son of man, have mercy on me. We've trusted in his death, his burial, and his resurrection, but we've then just gone our own way. We've gone and done what we needed to do. We've lived our life however we've seen fit despite the fact that we've been cleansed from this leprosy. And Jesus is saying, come back. Come worship. Come follow me. If you want to be rescued, you have to be with me. We're going to talk about this next week, the, the beauty of God's presence. If you truly want to be rescued, if you truly want to be cleansed, you have to be with God. Rescue comes from being with Jesus. Go back to him. It's not too late to turn around. It's called repentance. 
If you've been cleansed, you should tell somebody, right? That's what they tell them. Go, go see the priest. Go see somebody to tell them about it. You need to find community. Many of us still act like we live in the leper colony. We've been cleansed and we go back. We don't go back home. We don't go back to be with, with, with community. Be honest about what God has cleansed you from. Many of us are ashamed of our pasts. Why wouldn't we tell somebody about it? Why wouldn't we tell somebody? We all need rescue. And even in the midst of what you're going through now, you might say, well, Travis, that sounds great, but I've been a Christian, I'm a believer. If you're not a believer, you can definitely come to Christ today. All you gotta do is say, I need to be clean. You can talk to me about it. But if you've been a believer, if you've been a believer for a while, there are things in our life that we allow to to kind of fester and foment like a disease. And even though we are spiritually clean in the eyes of the Lord, we still need his cleansing presence in our life. We need rescue. It's a need. So his rescue is surprising, catches us off guard because the way it comes. It's a need that we have, but it's also accessible. Let's talk about how it's accessible. The last uh, chapters, the last verses in 53 kind of recap what's already happened. Look at verse seven. I'm gonna read the whole thing because I think it's so important. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days, and the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied by his knowledge, shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. He shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Like I've said, this is something we've already talked about. The way that Isaiah, the servant song is written, it's written in a chiasm, which means the first, ver- the first stanza and the last stanza go together. They mirror each other. The second and the fourth mirror each other. And then the fifth one, which is where we spent most of our time there, stands kind of by itself. It's the climax of the song. So I'm not gonna get into all these points, but what I do wanna talk about is how accessible Jesus makes this rescue. We know it's accessible because look at verse 12. Tail end of verse 11. He'll make many to be accounted righteous. He shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. Know how it's talking about the many, the many, the many. A large number of people are gonna get access to this. When a king would conquer with an army, he would allow his army to take some of the spoil, some of the plunder. That was his way of paying the army. Thanks for risking your life for me. Here's some of the loot. Jesus wins a great victory on the cross for us. And he receives great acclaim, great acclamation. But he doesn't keep it all the reward for himself. When we come to faith in him, we gain access to all this great, great benefit. The Holy Spirit living inside of us. We'll talk about that next week. New heaven and a new earth when Christ returns. A resurrected body. Peace with God. Peace with others. You're accepted. You're adopted. Jesus doesn't just leave us, it's accessible. In World War II, when the uh, concentration camps were liberated, most of them were on the Eastern Front. Some of them were on the Western Front, so the British and the French and the Americans, they would relieve those camps and they would provide humanitarian aid. But often when the Red Army, the Red Army was in such a, such a role, they were steamrolling the German Army so fast that they didn't want to slow down. And so they would liberate these camps, they would go in and they would set the captives free, absolutely. But they would say to them, they'd look at them and like, you can go back to your homes. You can go back to your life. And what we know now about the Holocaust, we know that go back to what? Our homes were taken. Our stuff is melted down. Our families are decimated. Go back to what? Jesus does not rescue us. Tell us to go about our lives and us have to look at him and say, go back to what? 
Jesus sets us free and he gives us so many rich blessings. And so this gives us two ideas. One, if our rescue is so accessible, that means there is no part of you that is inaccessible to God. You didn't go to the priest to present your leprosy and say, hey, hey, I'm like 99% clean. There's just this like one thing on my arm. I'm planning on just cutting that right off and we're gonna be good. Like I've got a dermatologist appointment next week. It's gonna be fine. We're gonna freeze it. It's gonna be great. No, you had to be completely cleansed. Every part was inspected by the priest. When Jesus, when we go to Jesus to give him our life, he's gonna cleanse us from every part, which means that he knows everything in our life. So whatever you're ashamed of, whatever deep, dark thing you're worried about, maybe there's something in your past, maybe there's something that's going on in your life right now, you're thinking about going through with it. You're like, yeah, I'm gonna walk this path. This is what's best for me right now. This feels right right now. Jesus knows about it and he still loves you and it's not too late. And even if it is too late to do something about it, it's not too late to confess, to repent and come home to him. Be the one that comes back even if you've wandered. The other thing to think about is how have you made the love of Christ inaccessible to other people? We have a tendency to do this. I'm worried about doing this to to family in my own life. Maybe being harsh, maybe being judgmental, maybe being passive aggressive. I show the Christ that I love, that I worship, to be like that himself. And he's not. How have you done this? How have you shown people that maybe God is judgmental, that maybe God is cruel, that maybe God is passive aggressive? Look at your interactions with other people. Look at the end of verse 12, and I think you'll see three things that we can do here to wrap up that Christ did, that we can show how accessible our God is. One, it says he was numbered with the transgressors. Spend time this week with somebody you consider to be a transgressor. Maybe it's somebody that you, that's far from Christ. Maybe it's somebody that you kind of look down on, you kind of judge, kind of like, well, they need to get their life together. Maybe it's somebody you don't like. Somebody that, that maybe you need to forgive. They're a transgressor. They've transgressed you and your relationship. Spend time with them. If Jesus can come and spend time with us and we've transgressed his laws and we wounded him and looked at him as despised, then we can spend time with people who have hurt our feelings too. It says too, he bore the sin of many. He carried our sin. What can you carry for somebody else this week? Maybe it's like a literal thing. You're gonna see somebody walking into the office with a bunch of packages. You're gonna help them with that. Maybe that's the case. Maybe it's something more figurative. Maybe it's something where where somebody's carrying a burden and you know they're carrying a burden and you're gonna pick up the phone and be like, hey, I know you're going through this. We haven't talked in a while. How's it going? And then lastly, it says, he makes intercession for the transgressors. Pray for somebody this week. We have access to the throne room of God by our high priest, Jesus Christ. Why do we not pray for other people? Pray for maybe that person. It says transgressors twice. Maybe pray for that person who's absolutely driving you nuts. Maybe pray for that person who needs forgiveness. Start by praying for them. And then maybe God will lead you to forgive them. We all need rescue. We've all been infected at one time or another by this spiritual leprosy. It's needed. And the way it came to us was a surprise. A baby in a manger. And what to many looked like a failed Messiah on a cross. But he didn't fail. Because he has access to the throne room of God and we now have access to all this plunder, all this spoil, all these riches that he wants to share with you, if you'll just come to him and say, Lord Jesus, I need rescue. And you'll get something a lot greater than you've ever imagined. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, how good it is to be rescued. Many of us don't like the idea of being helped. Many of us want to stand on our own two feet. I pray that you would help us to confess and repent of that pride. And that we would fall into your arms, Lord Jesus, and say, I need to be clean I can't keep faking it anymore. I can't keep acting like there's not this spot in my life. I need to be cleaned, Lord Jesus. Father, I pray that you would clean us today. I pray that there would be a celebration today. I pray that there would be joy today. And I pray that we would turn in hope and faith to you. We love you. In your son's name, amen.